Um, yeah, so I might have mentioned, but at the start of the slides, I try to explain what are in the slides. So if you open them up quickly, you just see what the what, what is happening. Um, okay, so apologies if I keep repeating myself, but it's if you come one thing I want you to come away with it is understanding the difference between mathematical modeling errors versus numeric errors. So the mathematical modeling errors is just when you start when you describe your boundary value problem, when you describe your partial differential equations, boundary conditions of your model. Looking at real life, you introduce some errors. They can often be the largest errors. So if you look at a, I don't know, some some problem and you think, ah, it's probably a linear elastic, and um, but it actually undergoes large plastic deformations, and you use the wrong value for your modulus, that means your answers might be off by like hundreds of percent, something like that. So it doesn't matter if the mesh or it's not. It won't, it won't be the same as reality just because you have poor assumptions. And, but in these slides, we're only going to talk about numerical errors. And so let's imagine that you do a good job of picking a material model and drawing your geometry and coming up with boundary conditions. You still have to get the answer from a software like Avidus, which uses the finite demo method. And the finite demo method and other related numerical methods and have at least three types of errors that they introduce themselves. And if you're not careful, they could dominate the solution. So even though you set up everything perfectly, you could just get a very wrong answer because you didn't, you weren't careful with the numerical errors. So the three types we're going to talk about are round off error, discriminization error, and iteration error. Some things they have different names for these. If you look at other courses and books, and discriminization error, sometimes they call this truncation error. But sometimes people call round off error truncation error. So that's why I'm not going to use the word truncation error because it can mean either. Truncation means cutting off something. And so in round off error, you cut off numbers. But in discretization error, you've cut off terms in the sequence. So sometimes people use the word trun truncation error. Uh, but I'm going to avoid that because it's ambiguous. And then iteration error matters more for CFD. So we're going to start ANSYS Fluent next week doing uh, CFD problems. And so iteration error will be something that will be immediately obvious in your face what it is. And so we'll talk about that in, a, in another set of lecture studies. If you want to check ahead, they are already up. It's just called article errors in part two. I think it's later on. Okay, round off error. So consider the following procedure. Let's imagine this is a, a piece of code. It could be pseudo code, but it's actually just map or octave code. So imagine I make a variable called x and I set it to the value zero. Then I define a variable called delta and I give it the value of 0 0.1. And then this little thing here, and this is just how you do a for loop in uh, MATLAB. So it's just how you loop through uh, doing something. So I set i equal to one to 1000. So basically this line here, x equals x plus delta is done 1000 times. So it just goes i equal to one, and it says x equals x plus delta. So x starts at zero, and then it says it's zero plus zero point one. And the next time it does it, it's uh, x equals zero point one plus zero point one. And the next time it does it, it's x equals zero point two plus zero point one. So it just keeps adding zero point one to the value of x over and over. So if I do that a thousand times, I would expect the answer to be a thousand times zero point one. So one hundred. And um, And so that's fine. And what happens if I try different values for delta? So 0 0.125, 0 0.2, and 0 0.2. And so you'd expect it's just 1,000 times value of that is the answer. So uh, we can try this. Um, you can try it if you want. Uh, don't, if you have MATLAB installed, great. Uh, but you can go to octave-online. So octave is like a free alternative to MATLAB that follows the same syntax. So there's an online. Uh, version of Octave you can just use. So I can, I'll do that now. And here's a little piece of code here, but uh, you can do it right up all out lines like this, but I just want to do it in one line. Uh, so I'm going to separate it by semicolons, which is like do this, semicolon means that's the end of the statement. So I'm just going to say x equals zero, delta 0 0.1, 4, 1 to 1,000, x is delta, x plus delta, and, and then I just added the statement f print f. Uh, so this is write out the value of x to 18 decimal places. So I'm doing that. Um, so let me just copy. I'm going to go here. Uh, link. And I'm going to copy this code. 
And this is my little Octave terminal. I just paste it in, press enter. And can I make that bigger? Okay, I did it like that. Okay, so the value should be 100. Math mathematically, we know the answer is 100. But I did it on a computer, and the answer I got is 99.999993. Okay. So let me try that again. So I'm like, okay, computers can't store numbers exactly. Um, uh, sort of, that's kind of simplification. So if I do 125, it gets it exactly. But one point, so point one, it has some sort of error in it, but point one two five uh, has no error. So now you can try the same at point two, point five. Um, and these are not random numbers, I picked them for a reason. So try point five, so point five works exactly, no error. And then point two five. Uh, also works. But if I try point two, uh, it doesn't, there's an error. So point one and point two had errors. Point one, two, five, point two, five, point five uh, had no errors. Uh, so why is this? Uh, so you may have already read the slides, or maybe you haven't, and you just have an idea. Any ideas? Why, why do some numbers work and some numbers don't? There's something special about 0 0.125, 0 0.25, and 0.5. There's some relationship you can think of. Any reason you can think? No? Is that again? Then the fives, that is, and um, okay, I tried 0 0.125, 0 0.25. That is certainly a, a pattern. That isn't the reason. That is a, a coincidence in this case. But yes, at least you've found one relationship between them. Any other ideas? Okay, so the reason is to do with how numbers are stored in a computer. So, how are numbers stored? What format are numbers stored? Any idea? Or how does how do computers store information? Binary. Binary. So what is what is binary? Ones and zeros. Zero. So how do you represent a number which is not one or zero in binary? So you have a big of numbers, and it's basically say you have eight numbers here. If you go one here, it means two to the, how many two to the power of ten now. You have one at the next one, how many two to the power of nine? Yeah. And then it keeps going down. And then if you go past zero, it's how many two to the power of minus one, two to the power of minus two to the power of one. Sure. So the way we store numbers typically is decimal, not always. For example, time, we don't use decimal. We normally use well, what you call it when it's base 12 or 60. Well, actually, it's a weird combination. So we count up to 60. Uh, seconds, and then we say one after 60 is one, one, one minute, and we know there's 60, then it's one hour. So that's like base 60 when we're counting seconds, minutes, and hours, or not hours. Then we go to base 24. And but typically, generally, use base 10. So base 10 means when we write a number with a decimal place, and um, what we actually mean is uh, to the left of the decimal place, this number seven here is how many 10 to the power of zero to have. Six is how many 10 to the power of ones we have, like six of them, 60. And then five here is how many 10 to the power of twos we have. And if we keep adding numbers, it's 10 to the power of three, four, five, six. And then to the right, it's 10 to the power of minus one, minus two. So when you see a number in decimal, maybe you don't think about that like that way, but that's actually what we're doing. So that's base 10, that's decimal. But you could just use any base. You could use take base two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then randomly people will use different bases. Like we use base 60 for some reason for time. So you could have like one hour, one minute, and one second. And we implicitly all know that means like this is one, one, 60, one 60 seconds. This is not a one 60 minutes or whatever. So then decimal, uh, because of the way it works with so transistors, they can just be on or off. Uh, it's just easy to store on or off. So zero or one. So then if they use base two, it's called one. 
So base two means if you have a number like this, this is the same number as that. I know you're like, well, how figuring, uh, how do you convert that to that? Well, okay, you can obviously just Google how to convert it. Somebody will do it for you. Um, but it's just, we're so used to this system. Uh, decimal is pretty convenient. Um, but you can equally just write it like this. So to the left of the decimal place, you have how many two to the power zeros, and two to the power ones, two to the power twos, two to the power threes, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, um, And then to the right, we have two to the power minus one, two to the power minus two, two to the power minus three. So go back to the numbers we just tried. Two to the power of minus one, one over two, that's a half. So 0 0.5 is stored exactly. If you write 0 0.1 in decimal, 0 0.1, convert that into binary, uh, it's not stored exactly. It's just an infinite sequence. So unless you can store an infinite sequence in binary, you won't have the precision, uh, like mathematical precision. So 0 0.1 uh, can't be stored exactly. So there's obviously, I don't know, there's probably numbers that can't be stored exactly in decimal. Decimal has more flexibility because there's more decimals. But if you have higher orders, there's probably numbers that can be stored exactly in those that can't be stored in decimal. I think we can give an example. And so I think if you check in this case, it should add up unless I made a mistake when I was preparing the slides. But if you check like two to nine plus all of these, uh, and you, you, can, you should get the same one. And oh, I give the, the website where I can go to the team track yourself. I think it lets you, that website lets you convert into other bases as well. If you do this. So that means that some numbers randomly will be stored precisely that we'll use in this one. Some won't be, they'll have a certain uh, precision loss. And that precision loss is called round off error. So the numbers just get rounded off. So point one, you need infinite number of decimal places in binary. You don't have an infinite one using floating precision in a, a computer, which is like the default. I'm not sure how many decimals that is, is like eight or nine decimal, like significant figures are stored. And if you use a double precision, it's uh, twice that. So after that, it just rounds it off. So that means it just adds a little bit of error. Just storing a number probably adds a bit of an error. Okay, and that's called round off error. Typically, you don't have to worry about that. And um, when people are writing methods to solve uh, systems of equation, like to convert matrices, and it does lots of operations, they have to be careful of things like round off error, but that doesn't build up and destroy the solution. Typically, we don't have to worry about it, but there are scenarios where we do have to be careful with it. And so one is if we have large numbers of time steps, then these small errors can, over time, cause the solution to go in one particular direction, which if you had a higher precision, it would go. And also when we go to use Fluent for CFD, when you open up Fluent, and as with Abacus, it by default will run in single precision. But fluids are a little bit more uh, unstable typically in the flows, so small perturbations can get amplified in fluid analysis. And um, so by default, you'll see in the videos, uh, there's a box that we you open fluent. It just says you want singular double precision. I often say just use double precision. We have enough errors to worry about without having to worry about round off errors as well. So even with small numbers of time steps, if you run in single precision, it can get very different answers for your analysis in a CT job. And um, so that is round off error. That's one type of error, round off error. The other two types are discretization error and iteration error. So discretization error is the one that you've so far probably focused on. Discretization error uh, can be just called mesh error, mesh errors. So it's just, uh, you probably already implicitly know that if you use a very fine mesh, your answer is more accurate. Okay. But we have to be careful with a statement like that. So when we say it's more accurate, it's more, the mesh errors are smaller. It's maybe a bit more explicit. So that means that it's more accurate in terms of describing the answer to the mathematical model. It doesn't mean it's closer to reality. So let's say, uh, I don't know, if some component here like the chair and I want to calculate the stress of like a chair. So I draw an ideal chair and I assume that wood isn't anisotropic, it's just isotropic and it's uniform properties. It doesn't have pores in it and stuff. I set that model up in my in Abacus and I run it and I get stress of the leg of the chair. Then I experimentally measure that somehow with liquid strain gauge or, or something like that. Let's take a strain and compare the strain. So then if a coarse mesh and it has an error of 1%, then I refine the mesh. The refined mesh could have a bigger discrepancy with reality. But that's not because the, the mesh errors are still getting smaller. It's just that your mathematical modeling errors 
could it just be, be by coincidence that the numerical errors are cancelling out more than one numerics on force match? And as you find the mesh, it could go further away. So that's why you have to be careful to quantify discretization errors and mesh errors first before you start validating the comparing the two reality. Because otherwise things might be cancelling out and you're not sure what's going on. So it doesn't mean it's more accurate, it just means it's more accurate at solving the solution than that type of model, not necessarily calculating your real problem. Okay, so uh, this is kind of like a tutorial. So this is the plate hole, and you're asked what was UY? I think that was the question you have to, to do is calculate what UY at this point is. So UY is the displacement in the y direction. This is one quarter of the plate, so there's like there's a symmetry plane here. So you imagine it's flipped, so the plate's being pulled in both directions, like the horizontal direction. The hole is kind of squashed in the ellipse. So that point would move down. You expect that to move down as a negative y. We haven't got the axis here, but the vertical direction is the axis. And then also we could look at the XX stress. You weren't asked to do that, but I'll just do it here. So if we remember what the find it end method does is it's trying to find the solution for the displacement field in our problem. So in reality, that displacement field is a continuous function. It's a smooth continuous function everywhere that varies in X and Y. And for this actual plate hole case, if you assume the plate is infinite in size, there is an analytic solution. You can actually you know mathematically what the answer is. And um, so that's why this test case is used a lot. Um, but to find the element method, as we know, it splits it up into elements, which are lines and nodes. And rather than trying to calculate the displacement everywhere, it just calculates the number of nodes. And then in between the nodes, it makes an assumption about what the displacement looks like. And this is what these shape functions are. Basically, shape function that's linear says, in an element, we just think it's linearly varying between the nodes. The reason they introduce those is that's how you calculate integrals. You have to integrate over volume, you have to know what it is. So that's what it does. So you can see on this mesh here that there's a difference between the values of the line and the underlying correct solution. So that difference is all discretization. It's because we're discretizing it as it's fitting in into a little bits. And there's an error interface. So another thing is this would make it look like that even if you split it up, the nodal values are all correct, but that's that's kind of false. Everything is coupled and related to each other. So if you get the slope wrong here, then the nodal values will probably be wrong elsewhere as well. They'll have an error associated. And so I generate two graphs here and I'll try to explain them to you so you understand what's going on. So I'll start with the right one first. Uh, apologies, it's kind of small. Um, okay, I'll leave it for now. Probably should have put it just large on the screen. So if I look at on this right graph, what it's showing on the axis is U2. So that's the displacement at that point. And then on the bottom x-axis, it's the element size. So I ran this plate hole problem with multiple different meshes. I just ran it, got the value at that point, and I changed the mesh, got the value of that point again, changed the mesh, got the value of that point. So I started with elements that were 200 millimeter in uh, width. That's their like height in width, on average. That's like the global C. Then I half that to two to 100. So that's a refinement ratio of two. Half it to 50, half it to 25, and half it to 12 and a half. So I did five. You only have to do three, but I did five. So I look at this uh, pink. Uh, graph here. This shows the answer I'm getting. So initially I get like 3.55. So I do a query in Abacus at that point and it tells me the displacement at that point. I don't even need to make a plot or anything. I'm just asking for displacement at that point. And as I refine the mesh, it drops the 3.72 or something like that. So I went from 3.55 to 3.72. As I refine it again, it goes 3.74 and refine it again, 3.75, refine it again, 3, and then, then it's only decimal places start changing. So you can see that as you refine the mesh, it approaches some mesh independent answer. And that's because the mesh error, this discretization error is getting smaller and smaller and smaller so that you're approaching the answer to the underlying partial dimension. Okay. So if you wanted to know, well, are your mesh errors big or not? You could just make this plot and just be like, well, looking at just this pink one, well, probably once we get around here, the error is pretty small. What is this line here? Well, this is just, if I go into the element type, and I untick the reduced integration, it calculates the uh, internal stresses in the element a little bit differently. 
that tends to be uh, less accurate for displacement, but tends to be more accurate for stress. So it doesn't matter, they'll all go to the same answer. It's just uh, for a given coarse mesh, one might be a little bit faster. And if you tick down, I did do quadratic, but if you tick on quadratic, you, uh, you, you'll see a different behavior. You'd expect them to be more accurate. So that's fine. I did the same thing over here with stress. So this was stress at that point, and the same element size. So using these pink ones, the default ones, the stress will increase, increase again, increase again, increase again. It's not leveling off. It just is always increasing. But if you were to extrapolate to what is the answer when the elements are zero in size, uh, that's like the mesh in the plan. Okay. But if I use these other types of elements, they very quickly kind of converge, and then they 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 give you a pretty accurate solution of the course mesh. And so they're both converging to the same answer and the same one here. It's just how quickly they get there and how far you are away at any point. That's what we're interested in. So what we would like to know is for a given mesh, and you're, if you're interested in something like displacement at a point, well, like how confident are you that that's the right answer? Or is, is the mesh error 20% or is the mesh error 0 0.002%? So that's the purpose of this method called the GCI grid convergence method. So the concept is, you basically extrapolate a line from any of these to the zero point and try and see what the answer is there and compare that to the answer on your current transmission. So the way that's done is, uh, it's not done here because you see these are curves. So it's kind of done in log space. If you make these uh, change the access to logs, then these would kind of go into straight lines and then you extrapolate in, on a log graph. And that's where the formulas uh, come, come from. Um, so as we reduce the size, the element size, the discretization error reduces. Um, and then can we quantify the size of the discretization error? And can we quantify the rate at which it reduces? How quickly we get smaller? A couple of other uh, qualitative comments. Discretization error in finite element time and volume. When you look at the colored pictures, it tends to manifest itself in discontinuous contours. So typically, not always, typically partial differential equations have smooth solutions. So if you look at the stress or the displacement fields, they tend to smoothly vary. Not always, by not always, I mean, if you think about a, a shock in front of like a re-entry vehicle coming from space or something, you get shock, which is like a step jump, so you get discounted and so forth. In general, for stress analysis problems. So if I run a fine mesh where the mesh area is quite small, uh, you get a, for any of the colored fields you look at, they generally are all smooth contours. Everything looks smooth. If I do a coarse mesh, you'll see something like this. You see all these kind of jagged lines and straight lines and stuff like that. That is an indication of mesh errors. So the mesh errors make it look like that. Yeah. So that's always a kind of quick way to check. You have no idea how big they are, but it's just that's an indication of that uh, has mesh errors. And um, so we're going to look at the a magnitude of the error, but then there's also something called the order of accuracy. An order of accuracy is not the same as accuracy. Order of accuracy is how quickly the error reduces as you refine the mesh. So if I half the element size, if I know the error is 10% and I half the element size, will the error half or the error only reduce by 20% or will it reduce by a factor of four? So methods which have a high order of accuracy will reduce faster than one really low order. So our linear elements are called their second order accuracy, which means if we half the element size, the error redu reduces by a factor of four, actually. If you have quadratic ones, it reduces by two to the power of three, which is eight. And, but that's in displacement, and uh, stresses and strains can reduce at a different order of accuracy. So typically in stress analysis simulations, displacements will be more accurate than stress and strains because they're the derivatives of displacement and they will converge more slowly. Okay, so the order of accuracy can be estimated using this formula. So that's kind of like uh, fitting a slope on the log graph. So we're moving towards extrapolating to what the zero element size uh, answer would be. So to do that, we're gonna estimate the slope, the slope at which the answers are uh, approaching that zero point. And that's called the order of accuracy. We call that P. So it's a natural log of if you piece three values. It's if we have the finest mesh, F1 is the finest mesh value, F2 is the next, and F3 is the coarsest. And then or 
is the ratio between them. So a ratio of two means that the ratio of the biggest to the next smaller size is two. And this formula assumes that the ratio between F1 and F2 and F2 and F3 is the same as well. Um, so I've given an example here from the data from the previous graph. I've given the element size and the UQs that I got for my different meshes. And, and if you plug them in, in this case, it says the order of accuracy is 2.8. So this is kind of measured over order of accuracy. So theoretically, they should be two, but depending on the on just the, uh, the mesh itself, like elements could be slightly different sizes, it might look like it's a little bit higher, a little bit lower than the second one here. And so it says 2.8. This formula, you can't get log of a negative number. So if this thing is negative, then it means you're far away from the solution. That means that this method only works as you start to get close to the zero element size of the solution. And so what you should expect is if I go from the value, say if I take the bottom three values, and if I go from the coarsest mesh to the medium mesh, you can see it's decreasing here. The numbers are very small, but it's 754 to 752. So it's decreasing. So we would expect the finer mesh to decrease again. It should approach the answer from one side. It shouldn't jump past it and change sides. So if it changes value, like it goes uh, smaller and then increases again, that means you're far away from the solution and you can't use this, this method. And also the difference between the coarse and medium mesh and the medium and fine mesh is decreasing as well. So it's always going in the same direction and it's getting smaller and smaller. So the GCI will only work when you're going in the same direction with the value and the value is getting smaller and smaller. Now you can do the same thing with stress. So you can see with stress, the order of accuracy is much lower. So theoretically it should be around one, but it's actually uh, observed to be a little bit less for this given uh, mesh and more than the time. So then the Richardson extrapolation method is just using that slope, and I'm not going to go through the derivation of it, but using that slope and the last few values, it takes the last few values and the slope, and it extrapolates to the zero element size value. And that's all that this is doing, that E1 is trying to estimate um, that value. Actually, this has been rearranged to give you the error. So on your finest mesh F1, and this E is giving you what the error is. So if it's positive, it means you need to add that on to your Find this mesh if it's negative, move it take it So, the true mesh independent solution as estimated by Richardson extrapolation is your finest mesh plus this error. So, if you wanted to get a slightly better answer, independent of mesh sensitivity analysis, you can just do this method and then add that error on and to give you a better estimate. So, if you do this for displacement, the E1, uh, the error for the displacement is like a really, really small uh, number, a fraction of a micron. So that means the true displacement is 3.749 microns uh, minus 0. 0.0000. So it only it changes the second decimal place. Um, so if you see 3.75, this is the value it's going to basically. So our finest mesh is 3.749. It's always already pretty close. It just shows that, well, if you have the error on, it's extrapolating to value what the zero element size actually is. And then you can do the same thing with stress. And the order of accuracy is much lower, means we're approaching the solution much slower. So that means that the error will probably be larger. So the error here uh, is this value there. So our finest mesh on the pink here was 3.60. And then based on this is minus 3.5. Oh, it must be this. I must be using the values from the uh, green one here. So it's extrapolating down to this point there. So I know we're at 40 minutes now, but just give me one more minute. So then the GCI method was a guy called Roach came along and he basically said, well, if we just multiply this by a factor of safety, which he kind of broadly statistically derived, and um, by the magnitude of the error. So 1.25 is this factor of safety, which is kind of statistic. I, I think he, I can't remember statistically, it's like within a 95% confidence interval broadly. You can say the true solution is equal to the finest mesh solution plus and minus the factor of safety by the magnitude of that error. So that Richardson extrapolation is not exact. It's just based on the meshes you have. This is probably the zero element size solution. 
So rather than just trying to use that probable one, just take the answer you do know, which is um, the finest mesh solution, and then calculate this error multiplied by a factor safety, that's called the GCI. So the GCI is just a measure of absolute error um, on your finest mesh. So if you get the answer is one meter, the GCI might be 0 0.1 meters. So that means you can be 95% confident that the true answer is one meter plus and minus 0 0.1 meters. So that, that's how the GCI works. Okay, and then this last slide was meant to be it. To, for you to be able to do it in practice. Though from talking with each of you, most of you, it's not so easy to follow. So maybe I'll try and make a short video just showing me doing the GCI analytics, something like that. But uh, that is that. So next week we're actually starting on uh, ANSYS. And so the instructions are there if you want to try and install ANSYS on your computer. Um, and if you have any problems, let me know in advance of the lab. Otherwise, I'll see everybody. Enjoy the weekend.